Greetings, everybody, and welcome to Chapter 8, Crime and Criminal Justice. Let's get started. Let's begin by talking about some media myths in terms of how crime is covered in our culture. The media tends to over-dramatize crime, meaning they focus on crime coverage at the expense of other things that might be going on in our society that might be more positive. There is also heavy, co heavy coverage of violent crime as opposed to other sorts of crimes murders, assaults, um, burglaries. Uh, while these are serious, there tends to be an overemphasis uh, in media coverage when these type of crimes occur. The media tends to highlight crimes committed by people of color as opposed to crimes committed by white people. And the media tends to highlight crimes committed by youth as opposed to people in their uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and upward. This is not to say the media is fake news, but it is to say they have enormous power in terms of influencing how we view uh, crime. And the media can heighten our sense of fear about crime and our fear of people of color, since in the media it seems like people of color are committing more crimes and more violent crimes than anyone else. Now let's talk about the issue of violent crime. A typical homicide, for example, involves two non-strangers who are arguing about this or that, and that argument then leads to a violent confrontation in which one or both of the uh, people have uh, access to a firearm. Notice this is non-strangers. This is not the uh, typical stereotype of someone hiding in a dark corner in a bush somewhere and pops out and murders someone. The majority of our homicides and murders take place between people who actually know each other. Uh, also, uh, contrary to conventional wisdom, most homicides are intra-racial, meaning uh, whites killing whites, black killing, blacks killing blacks, Latinos killing Latinos. The, again, the idea that a person of color is going to jump out of the bushes or around a dark corner and murder a white person uh, is simply not borne out by the statistics. Males commit about 90% of all homicides. And homicide rates are much higher in larger cities. However, homicide rates have been declining since the late 1990s. Now, let's compare that to white-collar crime, which is a crime committed by a person of respectability and high social status in the course of his or her occupation. What are some examples of white-collar crime? Healthcare fraud committed either by uh, doctors, hospitals, healthcare companies, um, people who are entrusted with our care in terms of how they bill or how they charge or how they collect uh, payments can uh, result in enormous amounts of, pro of fraud. Uh, corporate crime, where corporations are committing uh, all sorts of tax crimes, embezzlement, uh, fraud of any kind to help increase their bottom line or increase their profits. Corporate violence falls under white collar crime in which the actions of a corporation actually result in the death of people or uh, serious injury to people, uh, similar to unsafe workplace or unsafe products uh, in which people are getting hurt or killed in the duty, uh, their work duties uh, as they work for these corporations or people are dying or being seriously injured by the use of the products that these companies are making. For example, there are about $700 billion a year in losses due to white-collar crime and approximately 100,000 deaths per year as the result of white-collar crimes, compared with $20 billion in losses with street crimes and uh, those kinds of crimes and 17,000 homicide deaths per year. So you can see there's a big disparity between the effects of white-collar crime versus violent crime and street crime, and yet the attention 
the media tends to focus on is violent crime and street crime, whereas the real danger to our society may in fact be white collar crime. So who exactly commits crimes in our society? Well, we can look at statistics and break this down according to race. It's true that the majority of street crimes are committed by black and has Hispanic uh, folks, but the majority of white collar crimes are committed by white people. And when it comes to gender, and no surprise here, the majority of all crimes are committed by males. When it comes to location, our urban areas tend to have higher crime rates than our rural areas. And if we break it down by social class, again, poor people tend to be overrepresented in terms of street crime. Wealthy people tend to be overrepresented in terms of white collar crime. And the vast majority of people committing crimes tend to be between the ages of 15 and 24. But again, that is highly skewed toward street crimes. Uh, if we included all the white-collar crime in there, that median age would likely increase. The question for us as sociologists is why? Why is there crime in our society? There are lots of theories to help explain the persistence of crime. Let's take a quick look at each of these, starting with the social disorganization theory, which basically says that our urban areas in particular tend to be socially disorganized, meaning there is a lack of connection between people in these urban areas, even though they're living very closely to each other. And it's that lack of connection and organization within the micro society that they're living in that leads to higher crime rates. The anomie theory, developed by Merton, says basically people are trying to achieve goals in society, and if they don't have the appropriate means to achieve those goals, they will resort to crime as a way of achieving those goals. Money, success, a nice car, a nice computer. The differential association theory, developed by Sutherland, says that crime is a learned behavior. And if people are raised in families that are engaged in crime, those people have a much higher likelihood of engaging in crime themselves. Or if your friends and the people you're associating with are engaged in criminal behavior, there's a higher chance that you'll be engaged in criminal behavior. The social bonding theory is a bit like the social disorganization theory developed by Hershey in that he says it is the strength of, strengths of our bonds which will determine the likelihood of our criminal behavior. And this, the more social and, and strength, uh, strong those bonds are, the, more, the less likely we are to engage in criminal behavior. If those bonds are not strong or they are weakened somehow, there is a higher likelihood of engaging in criminal behavior. The labeling theory, a very important theory in sociology, says that if people are labeled bad or they're labeled uh, criminal or they're labeled defective somehow, that they will have a much higher likelihood of engaging in criminal behavior. And once they have been labeled as a convict or a felon, that the likelihood they will continue down that path increases as people begin to see them in a more negative light. The group conflict theory basically suggests that it's the nature of group behavior that leads to criminal behavior. Uh, for example, uh, different races competing with each other for resources, different socioeconomic classes competing with each other for resources, uh, men and women competing for each other for resources, native-born citizens versus immigrants competing for resources lead to the likelihood that someone in those groups are going to commit crimes as a way of getting ahead or getting their goals met, similar to the anomy theory. The radical theory suggests that the super wealthy actually use their power in ways that benefit them, and they use their power to influence government and laws and tax laws and all those kinds of things to benefit them at the expense of everybody else. And the everybody else then has to resort to some sort of criminal behavior just to be able to get ahead or have a 
equal playing field in some way with the super wealthy. And then the feminist theory, of course, is looking at the role of gender and uh, what kinds of crimes men are more likely to commit, what kinds of crimes women are more likely to commit, and what might prompt a woman to commit a crime, uh, such as murder, for example. Is she defending herself? Is she uh, attacking her attacker as a way of survival? Uh, these are all the kinds of questions that the feminists would be asking uh, with respect to the feminist theory and crime. All of these theories, by the way, are detailed uh, in section 8.5 of your textbook. I highly suggest you take a look at that if you haven't already to get more information on each one of these important theories. <laughs> And that brings us to our code words for this chapter. Make a note of this. Be sure to enter that into your Canvas assignment, Crime Theories. Now let's take a look at the death penalty and look at some myths and facts regarding the death penalty. One of the myths around the death penalty is that it deters crime, when in fact the evidence and studies suggest that the, uh, the death penalty itself does not deter crime. Um, lots of evidence to suggest this, although it seems like a likely conclusion. If you're going to lose your life by killing someone else, why would you do that? But yet we know uh, in states where they have the death penalty, those murder rates are no lower than states who do not have the death penalty, and in fact, they can often be higher. People often suggest the death penalty is a fair uh, penalty, fair retribution for taking the life of someone else when in fact the death penalty is racially discriminatory, meaning that a person of color is much more likely to be sentenced to death for murder than a, their white counterpart, part, uh, particularly if their victim was a white person. Uh, so the death penalty has all sorts of problems in terms of how it is used in our society with respect to a person's race. People often assume it's much cheaper to execute someone than to incarcerate them for life. The opposite is actually true. Executing people is far more expensive than incarcerating them due to the length of time it takes to work these uh, death penalty crimes through the justice system and the amount of money it takes uh, before somebody is actually signed off to be executed. Uh, and much cheaper to, ex to incarcerate that person than to put them through the long length uh, of a costly trial. However, despite all of this, about two-thirds of Americans do favor the death penalty. And as sociologists, we would want to dig into that and try to better understand why that is, when in fact the death penalty does not deter crime is more expensive than incarceration and is unfair and racially discriminatory. So how as a society can we go about reducing crime? There are many uh, <clears throat> criminal justice experts who argue for the public health approach, which suggests that not only should we help those who commit crimes, but we should work on better understanding the causes for crime and its preventative measures, similar to what we do with disease, right? We are trying to always understand the cause for disease and ways of preventing it from taking hold in our society. There are many people who suggest we should do the same with crime. What causes crime and how can we prevent it? One of the ways we can uh, help prevent crime is to reduce poverty. We know that out of sheer necessity, Often, very poor people resort to crime as a means of survival. We can improve our schools in poor areas and give children who are born into poor families in poor areas a better chance at a good education. We know that people with higher educations tend to be less prone to criminal behavior, although that's not always the case. We can look at how we uh, socialize boys and girls. We've talked about this earlier and specifically in terms of how we socialize boys and their tendency toward violent uh, solutions to problems. We can reform our prison system so that it's less like uh, a form of punishment and much more of a rehabilitation option to help people uh, get back on track and become 
contributing members of our society, and we can invest more in early childhood interventions, thus giving kids who might be more likely to end up in a life of crime uh, more of an opportunity for a successful life in our society. And that's going to do it for chapter eight. I'll see you in our next chapter. Thanks for joining me.